Good morning. <clears throat> okay. Today is Tuesday, the 31st of July, 2018. This is the Nibbles IO Daily Program and Stream. My name is Jeff. I write code every day, and I stream it here on Twitch, Monday through Friday. Um, I am working on base code, which is a programming language I am designing, and right now I'm working on the Bootstrap compiler, which is written in C++. And specifically this morning, um, so I want to move towards this test suite because I think it's going to be, it's going to make it easier. Um, but I want to clarify what I mean by test suite. So I'm not talking about unit tests per se, although I suppose they could be viewed that way on some level. But I think these are more kind of like integration tests. So what I would like to do, uh, but I got to do a couple of precursor steps to get there, is I have the base code alpha compiler command line interface. Either, and I'm still kind of debating on this, I'm going to add a facility to the compiler where you can specify a command line flag and a path and in this mode, it will scan the path that you give it for files, and it will execute those files, um, or compile them and execute them. Now, in the short term, they'll be executed in the interpreter only. Once we have native code compilation, then unless we specifically write meta code to run them at compile time, these would all execute at uh, after compilation as native code. That would be the ideal, because that's really the purpose of the compiler. And um, that would represent kind of an in-between state, um, meaning that um, ideally what I would like to do is have a base code meta program that does this test running, right? So all we would have to do is run the regular compiler against this one meta program file, and that meta program file would scan a folder, folders would run these tests. Um, and, and if we do it all inside base code, then there's lots more that we can actually do there in terms of better reporting and all that. But, you know, we're in this kind of in-between where um, the compiler and the language are not quite there to support all of that yet. So in the very short term, the compiler is going to kind of fill that runner role. And we're going to have to build up the absolute minimum uh, capabilities in the compiler and in base code to allow us to at least write some reasonable tests, right? So some kind of an assertion capability, um, something along those lines. So that's the idea. Um, and so with that in mind, um, I had a bunch of old sample base code files that are just not really applicable anymore. So I clean those out and I'm going to keep the Fibonacci thing for now. Eventually that's going to get replaced with a test suite file that is specifically does the Fibonacci and one for factorial and whatever. But I've gone to this one file, this simple base code file. We have one foreign declaration for print and we do the hello world. So um, I did this intentionally, right? So I, I shrunk it down to the smallest possible thing. And of course, ironically, that introduced or discovered bugs on its own. Um, so I fixed those. And now we have, um, we are 
to the point where we can generate this bytecode and this almost looks reasonable to run. Now there are things that are missing, right? We're, we're missing initializers, we're missing, missing finalizers, but temporarily, I think we can get around that. Again, so the idea here is get this running. This is like the base case and then start building um, test suite files around, you know, all the different scenarios in the language, which there, you know, there's gonna be a lot of them. Um, and, and then we'll discover the gaps and we'll fill those in as we go along. Um, so the assembler or the compiler is now assigning addresses properly to things in the, um, uh, the, the assembler and the instru instruction block structure. So um, the interpreter tells us that the heap starts at A0. And so that's where our first address is at. And things that do not modify the address, we just duplicate whatever that next address is here. Um, so technically these lines all kind of belong, I guess if you wanna look at it that way, to the next address generating line, which is this data declaration here. Um, this is the string literal dumped into memory. So this is actually the length of the string. This is the string. This is a null terminator. Um, so in memory, I'm going to cheat. <laughs> I'm going to keep a null terminator at the end of strings um, because that'll make it easier to integrate with C libraries without us having to do a bunch of copying and shuffling and things like that. Um, and then this is our call to print. And so we're moving the address of um, string literal 86, pushing that address on the stack and calling print. Um, and then we exit, right? So this is like, <laughs> this is really simple. Um, and technically, okay, so the next thing we have to do is this label is not resolved. So one of the things I wanted to do is in disassemble, um, Okay, here we go. Okay, so I think the way So we're gonna look up, find unresolved label up. Did we find it? We did. Right. Okay. Okay. So what I'm trying to figure out
Okay, I think I remember what I was thinking. So the resolution is that the label would be set, the label pointer would be set. Um, So if we actually have the label, right, if it's been resolved at this point, then to format it as the label name and then in parentheses we're going to put the we're going to put the address of where in memory that's pointing at otherwise we're just going to return the name have you ever made script software and sold them on marketplaces like Code Canyon, Theme Forest? Uh, some stuff I've done in, for game publishers might qualify for that, but probably not. Um, not. Yeah, probably not. Have you thought about making a game on stream? Yes, I have. I, I have some evil plans in that direction, maybe. We'll see. Um, subgroupings of games in my mind. One of them is definitely I would consider to be commercial, a commercial endeavor. It would be something I would want to release on Steam and probably, you know, platforms, uh, console platforms. Um, and I think it's an interesting take on where things or you know based on what's out there now I think it might be an interesting take but I don't know um, it might not it might be a boring idea 
I have another subset of games which I would call casual gaming or, or educational gaming, not one plus one equals two type gaming. I mean games more for the purpose of learning programming. A lot of that's probably going to focus in on, on Ryu um, because once I get Ryu done, um, or at least a version one out there, a lot of what I intended to do with Ryu was to use it to build things on stream and assembly language to teach that sort of thing. Um, so that's kind of another tier uh, there. And yeah, we'll see. It's definitely stuff I think about frequently. I just, you know, I gotta do things kind of step by step. Um, hey, gun games, still haven't forgotten about you. I did some work on it yesterday, gotta finish today. Um, what is the best language to learn in 2018, in my opinion? Um, <laughs> uh, again, I, this question is tough because if I take the question at face value, um, then my answer to you would be learn assembly language. <laughs> um, it's always the best thing to start with. It's always the best thing to learn. And you can always learn all the other really cool high level shit later. Um, but that question to me, I have a hard time not reading in the following. What is the best language to learn so I can make big bucks in 2018? And if that's the question, then the answer is Python. Um, if, if you're just going after money, if you're just going after what's going to look the best on my resume, what's going to get me a, what's going to give me the highest attention right now, it seems to be Python. Now that, that could change, right? And I think I said this maybe a couple of weeks back, I would say right now, if, if you're asking for resume purposes, for job purposes, Python, JavaScript, TypeScript, whatever combination of JavaScript shit that you would want. Probably then after that Java, then C Sharp, then whatever else, right? Um, so it just really depends on what your motivation is for learning the thing. If you just want to learn, just to learn it, then assembly language. If you don't already know it, right? If you, if you know assembly language, then graduate to C. If you already know C, graduate to C++. Um, if you already know those three, graduate to Rust. Play around with Rust a little bit. I, I don't say that to say that I think Rust is a solution or magic or anything. It's just it's another thing in that category of languages, um, low level memory manipulating languages that might be worth spending time on. But I wouldn't start with Rust um, because again, there's a lot that's gonna be very confusing unless you understand what assembly language is, what the machine is doing fundamentally at the lowest levels. Once you understand that, so many of these other concepts um, make much more sense. They become so much easier. If you say, I know C++, then you're lying years into C++, I'm still learning. Yeah, I mean, okay. I, I don't take that attitude. Um, <laughs> that, <clears throat> again, I've said this before, there is, oops, bumped the wrong thing there. That's bad. Um, yes. Are you technically inaccurate if you say, if I say, and I've been coding for 30 years, um, 
If I say I know C++, am I lying? No, I don't think I'm intentionally lying. Um, am I inaccurate in my phraseology? Yes. You know, if we got into pedantry, right? And again, you guys know how much I love pedantry. So whenever this comes up, I got to like rail on it. Does it help anybody that you can say, I know all 10,000 pages of the C++ spec? Maybe, maybe it does if you're on the committee, but who would want to be on the committee, right? So outside of the how many, 10, 15 people that are on the committee and they're all vendor employees and maybe a couple of independents, I think, who gives a shit, right? Like, so the, the answer to the question, can you be competent and productive in C++ and then on a daily basis, the way, you know, we all here in America talk, if you say, I know subject X, what we assume is that you are not a language lawyer God and that you have memorized every aspect of that topic from one end to the other, with the exception of perhaps, um, well, but I'm trying to make a point here, okay? I'm trying to make a point that when you say something like that, when you say no one can know C++, you're lying. That's a very strong statement, right? Um, they're not lying because the common day Alabama interpretation of I know X is I'm not a complete and total fucking moron in X and I'm able to do stuff with it, okay? It doesn't mean that I am a professor and that I have memorized all history, all details, all minutia, all, you know, fucking pedantry on that topic. That's not what it means, okay? And if you're interpreting it that way, you're just being an internet troll. I mean, I'm sorry, it really pushes my buttons. Um, this is not a true statement. You can know C++ effectively, you know. Look, man, I'm not picking on you particularly, but you're the one that said it. And so, and if you hold that opinion, fine, you hold that opinion. My point is, it's, it's like, Sinox wants to argue about what OO means, you know, from some platonic, you know, uh, and, and we can have those kinds of debates if we frame it that way. But I can tell you that his perspective of what OO means is absolutely the minority, right? Nobody else thinks that way. Um, and, you know, calling people liars because they say they know X, um, I, you know, I don't, I don't see that it serves purpose, right? You, you can work with somebody and discover whether or not they know something, right? And just because you don't know some particular arcane corner of a topic, um, you, you, well, but so again, I've said this before, the one thing that I dislike is pedantry, right? The one thing I dislike is, you know, <laughs> taking something average and doing the internet thing where we have to go and like, oh, well, I'm smarter than you. And again, I know you're not saying it to me. I use this as an example. You just happen to be the one that, you know, flipped my, my, my bit this morning. So it's not personal, but I'm, I'm using it as an example here. Don't think that way. That's my point. It's not that you said it. It's not that it's right or wrong. It's, it's just the wrong way to think about things, right? Don't approach life as a pedant, it will ruin your life <laughs> and it will upset people around you, right? Um, unless somebody specifically asks you to be pedantic, it's not worth it. And it definitely is an internet thing. I know that, I get it. But, you know, I, I just, I guess it's my mission, right, to dissuade people from doing that, right? Um, because it doesn't serve any purpose. You know, if you go to NASA or you go to your employer and they're like, you know, okay, we, we gotta get really specific about this. We gotta like really know the details and, and it, like every little interpretation counts, right? Um, fine, 
then in that case, somebody's asking, you know, like a lawyer, a lawyer is going to be pedantic, right? Because that's what they're being asked to do. They're being asked to read, you know, a filing with the court. They're being asked to read a judge's ruling. They're being asked to look at a situation. Yeah, they're going to nitpick the shit out of it because that's their job. But most of us, you know, again, unless you're in a very specific case where that sort of makes sense, it's counterproductive. Okay, I'll stop ranting about that now. Sorry, I just... <sighs> and I guess to that broader point, nobody can know, no one can ever know anything then, right? Um, there's always something new. But that's not practical, right? People, you can't just say, oh, well, I don't know. I, I'm not really, I don't know C++. I guess I've been writing it for a long time, but I really don't know it. That's not a practical statement, not a practical mindset. Uh... Yeah, I mean, I know the language. Again, I there's the common everyday person interpretation of words. You know, the law actually has, in the U.S. anyway, and I'm sure this is true everywhere, everywhere else, the law actually makes a distinction between common usage of words and domain-specific usage of words. Um, it's like that guy, uh, oh crap, oh, James Damore, yeah, the guy who got fired, right? And the more I read about that situation, the, the one thing I think that got him like into the most trouble was he used the word um, neuroticism, being neurotic, but that's a domain word. And if you follow, um, you know, that particular subset of science, you know, social science, and I'm, I'm sure there's some uh, psychology and stuff related to that, neuroticism has a very specific definition that is, um, it's rigorous within that domain, right? Um, but the common everyday interpretation of neuroticism is less than flattering, right? And that's where, you know, you get into trouble. And that was his mistake. His mistake was thinking he was talking to people who were going to take the time to be pedantic and look up the exact definition of the words that he was using, which is not the case, right? They're going to use whatever definition they would typically use in their daily lives. So, yeah, we just, we gotta be nice, gotta be nice, we gotta try, like Mr. Rogers, <laughs> I can't believe they're making a movie about him, it's kind of depressing. I mean, in some strange way, I also think that's kind of what's happening with the job market right now. Like, I, I've had a couple of interactions over the past, say, three months where um, I walked away and I felt like the the uh, the channel, if you will, in which an acceptable answer existed for them was very narrow, and it certainly, at least my recollection of years gone by, um, people weren't quite so pedantic about things. Now, again, they might be setting those up intentionally so they can filter more people out because they have so many, I don't know. But um, certainly the whole thing of, well, I'm a programmer, well, but you haven't used Java in the last two weeks. Or the last time you used Java was a month ago. So therefore you are no longer a Java programmer, right? Like that sort of stuff just, it's weird. 
James Damore was right. Well, again, so I'm not, I'm not debating. Uh, I agree. Like, should have, should James Damore have been pilloried and fired for what happened to him? No, that's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is, it's the same thing as Sam Harris does this too, right? And and people have told Sam he does this, right? Uh, the uh, the astrophysicist, what's his name? Oh crap. Um, Neil deGrasse Tyson, right? They had a whole conversation about it, and he's not the only one. Sam assumes he's talking to people who are academic. He assumes that he's talking to people who will debate using the rules of debate. And like none of the people he talks to <laughs> practically fall into that category. And that's just, a, that's a, to me, that's a mistake on his part, right? You can't, you cannot assume rigor on the other side, right, that doesn't exist. Unless you like go through a whole bunch of negotiation up front before you engage. Um, like, so if James Damore wanted to, now would the outcome have been the same? Probably. But if he like really wanted to cross his T's and dot his I's, he would have had a 50 page glossary in front of his 10 page paper that in excruciating detail defined all the terms that would have been trigger points for people. But um, yeah, I mean, would it have changed the outcome in his case? Probably not. But, uh, and again, I don't agree with what happened to him. So me saying that he made a mistake doesn't mean I agree with the side that pilloried him. I don't, but I understand on some level how the mistake makes things worse, I guess is my point. <clears throat> I've said it before that the elitism is really destroying the programming community. So it's interesting that you mention that because I made a couple links here, new links. Why no docs? So I saw this on Hacker News this morning and I was reading through the thread and I thought, wow, this, people ask me all the time, do you have anything written down about base code? Do you have any documentation? Do you have a spec for your language? And the answer is no. The answer is I have these videos and if you want, you can watch them. And that hacker news thread is why I don't have anything written down. Because here's somebody who built a language, uh, Grain, I think is the name of the language. It actually looks kind of interesting. I think I was quasi impressed, right? And they proceeded to tear it to shreds because the documentation didn't meet their standards. And this is the problem, right? See, people ask, well, do you have this stuff written down? But it's not, oh yeah, I have, I'm in the process of building and here's a bunch of to-dos and that doesn't work because people's expectations are way up here. So if you put written words out there, they had better fucking be perfect. And you better have every example that you wanna have. You better show every great feature of what it is that you wanna build, right? Because if you don't, then you're gonna get shit on, right? And, and there's another um, called uh, premature release. This is, I found this on Reddit. This is uh, the post that, or, you know, or the thread that came about when um, Ginger Bill announced Odin, the programming language, right? And he proceeded to get shit on in the entire thread, right? So these two to me are an example. And in the future, when people ask me, do you have anything written down? Why don't you have anything written down? Do you have words written down somewhere? I'm gonna reply with these links. No, I don't, here's why. Because until it's done and it works like 100% and I can then craft documentation that covers everything in perfection, right? And maybe then I miss just teeny tiny little things here and there. Then at least if everybody shits on it, I can say, well, okay, I. I did the best that I could do 
right? Um, I had code examples on the first page. I demonstrated metaprogramming right away. I tried to show the best features that you know make my language stand apart from everybody else's and yada, 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 right? But I can't, until I get to a significant point of completion, right? Like I can't do that. And these examples, and I've seen others, right? These are just ones I've seen recently. Um, these examples just reinforce my belief that showing this stuff early is a bad idea. Um, I mean, I, again, I don't know John Blow, but I think that's why John doesn't release anything because he knows what's going to happen. He knows that it's just going to be a shit storm, right? Um, so you might as well just hold it back. You know, the people who are interested, maybe they wane, you know, their interest wanes or they go away or maybe they come back. But in the end, as the creator of the thing, you save yourself a ton of stress and anxiety by just waiting, right? Until you can at least say, okay, this does everything I think it should do. And I'm happy with that. And here's all the written documentation. Here's all the examples. Here's all the code. Um, and I, I could be wrong, but I think if you go to that extent, and you meet people's expectations, you're, you may get blowback, but not quite as badly, right? Um, but, yeah. The internets are a dangerous place. So... Okay, what was I doing? Okay, I think I... <clears throat> Changing gears a little bit, but this is something I struggle with when I code. I kind of find like I'm a little lost with what to do in life at the moment. Would you say coding is your passion or does coding allow you to do something you're passionate about? Um, boy. So, where to go here? First, I will preface what I'm about to say with the following. Nobody, including myself, knows what the fuck they're talking about. So this is just some guy in the southwestern United States at 5.43 a.m. local time talking out of his ass. So, you know, weigh it appropriately, okay? <laughs> There are two competing schools of thought in this regard, and they're both right and they're both wrong. And they're both right and they're both wrong because they're both trying to capture something that, in my opinion, is we simply don't have the science or the understanding to capture it. So what is this thing they're trying to capture? They're trying to capture what we call luck. And I've talked about this before, okay? <laughs> um, luck is luck and if you press extremely successful happy accomplished people hard enough especially if you've gotten them to imbibe some alcohol they will admit that they're lucky right that they were lucky that something happened that they can't quantify or describe or explain and they are where they are. And I would posit, and this is just a theory that floats around in my brain, not a theory, a hypothesis, because I can't prove it, um, 
that's the reason why I think you see so many celebrity deaths, celebrity deaths, so many celebrity suicides. Because even Anthony Bourdain, now again, I'm just speculating here, but he's said in interviews, and he's even written, that he really has, like, it's luck. That he is that he got where he got um and i think that's unfortunately that's true right of most of the folks that we look at and say gosh you know not in a bad way i think some envy is that's having a role model having some template of hey that looks like something i would like it's not all bad right the problem is um how to get that is unclear, right? Now, that takes me to the two schools of thought. School of thought number one. I'll call it the Oprah school of thought, okay? This is the, or the Madonna school of thought. This is the find your passion and the money will follow line, okay? So, how do you find your passion? Well, one way you could do that theoretically is every day you wake up and the thing that you do or the thing that you think about, even if you don't take action on it, right? If you think about building a race car or you think about, you know, flying a plane, or if you think about, even if you're not taking action on those things, if those are your predominant or recurring thoughts, if you recurringly think of writing software, you recurringly think of writing a book. Well, maybe, possibly, that's a passion. That's something that would drive you. Intrinsically, you would want to strive to accomplish something in that space, okay? But you have to be attuned to what your brain's telling you, what your body's telling you, right? Um, and it's not always very clear. It's not, your brain's not gonna come and just whack you over the head and say, oh, you know, you really wanna do X. You have to kind of pay attention to the clues. And, and I will say, and I've said this before, and this is not an endorsement of organized religion. This is an observation. I will say that religious people tend to be better at this than non-religious people. The reason is, is because in many ways, listening for or looking for a sign from the divine is the same modality as listening to your brain try to tell you what the fuck it wants you to do, okay? Um, so again, to disclaim, I am not suggesting people should go um, join a religion or start praying. What I'm saying is there are similarities in the behavioral elements that are related in, in finding these clues. And these clues that religious people are getting is not coming from some guy up in the sky who cares whether or not you jerk off in the shower. It's coming from you. It's coming from inside, but it's coming from that deaf mute part of your brain that can't communicate to you with words. It has to communicate to you through images and impressions and intuition and feeling and that's what it does um, so that's the follow your passion thing right now here's the challenge with follow your passion right um, you could find your passion and I would say for me um, yeah I would say programming is a passion for me I'm good at it I feel comfortable when I'm doing it. I feel like out of all the other things I've ever done in my life and all the things I always endeavor to do in my life, programming is the one thing that I'm very competent with, that I feel like, <laughs> while I don't know everything, I know a lot, and I feel like there isn't anything I can't learn in the space. Um, except maybe quantum computers. <laughs> I don't know, that might, that might take me until the end of my life. Um, but here's the thing, 
there are lots of passionate people on the planet. There are lots of people who are trying to feed the homeless and build housing for the, you know, the poor and who are trying to get rid of all the trash and get rid of the plastic, you know, blob in the ocean that's, that's gaining sentience and, you know, um, and they don't make any money, right? Um, so the problem with the Oprah school of thought of sit in a room, turn off the lights, close your eyes, listen to yourself, and you'll discover what it is your passion is, um, that that does not necessarily translate into economic output, right? The, the path from having a passion to being able to support yourself, not even necessarily being rich or famous, just being able to make, say, 60,000 US dollars a year doing whatever your passion is, is not very clear cut. And that's where that thing called luck comes in, okay? Now, the other school of thought. The other school of thought is like the Mike Rowe, if you guys know who he is, right? He was the host of that show, Dirty Jobs, and he talks a lot about, you know, folks should not follow their passion. Uh, there's another uh, gentleman, his name is Marty Nemco. He's a, he's a professor, he has untold number of degrees. He runs a um, job, uh, I guess like a placement or a or job finding service for folks. Um, he has a bunch of videos on YouTube if you care to watch any of his stuff. Some of it's good, some of it's not so good. But I would say that like Mike Rowe and Marty Nemco are kind of in the same camp. And their camp is don't follow your passion. That's bad advice. If you have a passion, great. Make it a hobby, right? Whatever your passion is, realize it is most likely not going to make you any money and should not drive your day-to-day decision-making in any way. Instead, what you should do is look for what economic opportunities are in front of you, whatever those might be, and go do those, right? And that's how you make money. And, um, and then you do your passion on the side. And um, the challenge with that one <laughs> is that um, it's easier said than done, right? You know, these guys will look at, well, look, there's all these, um, there's all these jobs, right, that nobody wants. Or these, you know, Marty Nemco talks about low prestige jobs. Like his favorite recommendation is to start a, uh, like a flower or knickknack cart business in a big city and you know you sell umbrellas when it rains you sell scarves when it's cold that sort of stuff it's very low prestige no one wants to compete nobody wants to do that right but if you do it and you just treat it like you know a business and you could th theoretically scale that right but again could theoretically you know, there, that thing called luck, right, still comes into the picture. Um, yes, there's tons of maybe low level dirty jobs like cleaning septic tanks and driving trucks and, but there are trade-offs um, for doing those jobs, right? And like, as my example, you know, if I use myself, like even if I like some of those ideas, like, oh, hell yeah, I'll do a hot dog cart or whatever. Um, but there are certain, like I, I have certain illnesses, diseases <laughs> that they're not contagious or anything, but it just makes it difficult for me to do that sort of thing, right? Um, and, it, and I would have always kind of had that problem. Um, now maybe you don't have that problem but again, it's, it's not so clear cut, right? There's the, what's your dream? Go follow it, you'll get there. If you just work hard enough and keep banging on doors and making a nuisance out of yourself. And then there's no, you're never gonna get there. 
the statistics are just not in your favor, you know, acknowledge that and then just find something that makes money and lets you live your life. But so I would argue though, not always, but the follow your passion camp tend to be where career minded people are at. And the, you know, I just want to work to pay my bills so I can do other things. I want to work to live, not live to work camp is in the other, just find something that makes money. It may not be very prestigious and it may not be a career, um, but you can always do your own thing on the side. The other issue of course, is that again, those folks that are in the career camp and the follow your passion camp probably tend, when they hit pay dirt at some level, they tend to make a lot more money, you know, on the other side, you could build up to a lot of money again, if you're very lucky. Um, so I don't know if that answered your question, <laughs> but it's, you know, passion is a tricky, it's a tricky topic, right? One of my brothers, he's, a really good musician. He's an excellent guitar player. He went to university to study uh, performance arts and specifically jazz. That was his passion. Um, you can't make any money doing it, right? Like the chances of making money playing jazz music in 2018 are probably fractions of 1%, um, depressingly so. Um, I mean, I remember when we were much younger, he used to gig in Chicago a lot and payment was you get a burger and a fry and they give, they validate your parking, right? That's payment. <laughs> um, so, you know, could you be successful musically? Maybe. I mean, the irony was, and we always kind of like scratched our heads trying to figure out why. He had a classmate who played vibes and this guy got a record deal, <laughs> you know? So like, why, how, you know, it, but again, it comes back to that. Maybe music publishers were just, record labels were just desperate for somebody to play the vibes or it was luck or he knew somebody um, and you know, but see music business, show business, and I would say code business in terms of setting your expectations appropriately. Can somebody today get an average job in code? Yes. Can you get an average job in music or show business? Probably not. Not really. I mean, you could be a a studio musician or you could play bit parts or whatever, but you're, you know, there, there is a difference there. Um, my thing though, is a lot of us in the code space, we look at certain folks who are equivalent to what I would say would be successful folks in the music or show business, right? We look at folks like John Carmack or, you know, Tim Sweeney, or whoever, right? And we think, okay, how do I get there, right? And that's, that's why I would make a comparison to those other industries. Um, or even one step below that, right? Um, even just getting a job at a FANG, right? Um, is kind of like a holy grail right now. Uh, although I think the holiness is about to rub off, <laughs> but, uh, yeah, it's, that's sufficiently removed, right? From the rest of the country in terms of if I got a programming job in Oklahoma or in Texas or in Chicago, I might be well paid, but I'm not going to be paid silly, silly Valley pay. Right. Um, so. That's what I'm gonna call it from now on, Silly Valley.
The great Rico, I'm curious, what, what country are you in where the mafia would, would uh, mess up my hot dog cart or my little, my little sales cart? That, that would be, that'd be scary. Welcome, little fire studio. And Everex. Good to see you back. And move. Russia. Okay. Yeah. Well, that's kind of scary. Okay, so this, um, you're welcome. I hope it was helpful. I, you know, I tend to go off on a tangent. <laughs> I'll tell you, man, uh, I, the hot dog cart becomes more and more appealing as the days goes by. Days go by. <clears throat> Interactions are very simple. You know, what would you like on your hot dog? Would you like chips with that? Would you like a drink? Oh, you didn't like your hot dog? I'm so sorry. Here's your money back. I mean, you know. Not, oh, hey, um... I'm sorry to call you on Sunday, man. I, 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 I'm, I'm really sorry, but, but listen, um, you know that senior executive, executive, executive douchebag VP? Yeah, yeah. Well, he had this big meeting, and um, the, the deadline's been moved up. We, we have to do that, uh, that release on Wednesday. Wednesday next week? Yeah, yeah, Wednesday next week. <laughs> uh... But we haven't even started the project yet. Oh, I know, I know. <laughs> uh, I'm not, well, I will say I haven't been feeling super great um, like the past week. I don't know why. Um, Wednesday previous week? Is that when I started feeling bad? <laughs> Is that when I started getting grumpy? Okay. I don't doubt it. Um, all right, let's see here. So this walk here in the assembler, this is walking all the blocks. Um, oh, Wednesday previous week. Oh, I gotcha. The call from my uh, the call from my project manager. Yes, exactly. Right. Yes. Oh yeah, dude. I I'm so sorry, but he's really pissed. Like for some reason, he thought this thing was gonna ship last week. Um, like we're we're gonna get our asses handed to us. Like my ass isn't gonna be handed to me. <laughs> I'm gonna tell him he's an asshole. <clears throat> Which is why I then won't have them as a client. <laughs> But that's okay. Actually, ironically, sometimes that doesn't go the way you expect. Um, sometimes when you push back with you know those guys, not always, but sometimes, especially if they are in the sociopath psychopath spectrum, um, it throws them a little bit, and they don't know how to manipulate you anymore, and so they kind of back off a bit. Again, it's not, I don't advise that strategy. Only crazy people like me do that. Hey, Cyanox. All right, so this loop here is applying addresses to everything in the uh, assembler. <laughs> exactly. You just, you just have to put a text box there. Like, why is it so difficult? I'm trying to 
trying to think if I can do this without having to loop again. But unfortunately... Well, let's do it this way. We'll call this apply addresses and then we'll have um, resolve labels. Okay, so we have unresolved. Oh, I've had those conversations before EverX. I've had people, oh yeah, Ugh. It's never good. So here's the thing about contracts, um, at least in the U.S. I don't know about other countries, but in the U.S., um, of course, you should have a written contract. You should have your attorney review all contracts that you sign um, and have them actively involved in negotiations. Um, 
But here's the thing that you, again, this is a US centric perspective because here everything costs money. <laughs> um, and the thing that you realize is that, or you learn, contracts are only as good as the amount of money you're willing to put behind them. Um, so yes, you can have a contract with a client, you make them sign it, you can have your lawyer put in all sorts of very great things that theoretically would make it foolproof for you. And sometimes the threat of litigation is enough to persuade some clients, but there's a lot of them where it's just a business practice, right? Like they, especially the bigger entities, they, they have staff lawyers, right? They're already paying. So they have to have something to do. Um, and so it's not all that uncommon for some companies just completely ignore um, contracts. And again, you have to then enforce it. And the way you enforce it is you pay more legal fees to enforce it. So always keep that in mind. Um, yes, you can have paperwork around it, um, but you have to be prepared and have some money set aside um, so that that stuff can be litigated. And then you discover that the most common tactic there, again, for companies sufficiently large that they, they either have staff attorneys or they have attorneys on retainer permanently, um, then they just play a waiting game, right? If you go after them, they just try to expend your money um, by dragging it out.
<laughs> it's a good comeback. See you, Cyanox.
Okay, so if we pass in a block find visitor, we're returning back a pointer if the callable turns back a pointer. Otherwise, we keep navigating through, eventually return null. For the predicate version, we return true. Unless something fails, it says false. Then we stop. There's some template magic. <clears throat> All right, so. Because what we want to do, because um, this is, we're going to use this find label 
after um, we're going to use this after we've built everything. So we want to go from the top down because the labels are going to live in the nested block that they were defined in. Um, and then, so what we're going to do is in resolved labels, we're going in every block, we're going to walk the unresolved labels collection and we're going to um, take the name on that ref and we're going to look it up. If we find it, we stick the pointer on the structure and that's step one of it. Um, and if we do that, then we should see addresses then on all the labels in the disassembly which right now we only see addresses on labels that were defined earlier and then we could find them by hunting up at the time of declaration or usage. Right? So the string literal, we can find the address of that because it was defined ahead of us. But this, right, this is what we're trying to fix here. Initializer isn't showing an address because this ref, it doesn't know where that's at at the time of assembly. So we're going to go back and fix those up. So resolve, oh no, that's on assembler. So we're going to walk the blocks and each block has an unresolved labels map on it. <clears throat> this is the one we need to, we need to update the label ref T in there. Okay, so what am I doing? I don't know. Um, no. Unresolved labels. So for uh, 
given block. You get the label references. And we're gonna walk each one. And we know the name on the label ref. So going to start at the top, try to find the label using the name. Oh no, it's resolved. That's what we want. Okay, so this is going to start at the root. It's going to get each block's going down the chain, um, references that it has to find, and then we loop through those and we try to refine from the top down every time um, that, that label. If we don't find it, That by him, okay. That's my, that's how I do it. Just see what happens. <laughs> It'll probably break, but that's okay. So there's one other thing that if I get this working, that is, I got to figure out how I want to do this. So, um, and see, this is where initializers would come in to play. Um, that would really be the best place to do this, but um, uh, I'm guessing Rust borrowed that FMT thing from C++. I'm not sure. Maybe. Possible. Yeah. That's a good question. I'd have to look at that cargo package uh, and see if um, see how that works in Rust. But they may have heavily, yeah, I, they may have heavily um, borrowed yeah, the ideas. Okay, so unable to resolve label initializer. Which is kind of the one I figured it would fail on if it was going to fail. Yeah, the format uh, library is pretty nice. I like it.
Oh, I bet I know what's going on. I do this every time. <laughs> uh, I'm really smart. I'm just so smart. So actually, this will probably resolve it now. I hope. Ah, unable to resolve label print. Oh, right, because it's a foreign. Here's what we should do for that. I have I have the answer for that. Um, what we should do is my procedure type. Yeah, so if it's foreign, we're bailing. But that's not right. What we should be doing is we should So I move the code up that's going to get the label. If it's foreign, we're going to make a basic block, add a memo. That allows us to create stuff without instructions, per se. We're going to create the label for it, which is going to be based on that name now. Yeah. Um,
see if it emits the label at least the data is not right and I I knew that I needed to do that so when we run the um, foreign directive we look up we load the actual module we look up the actual address of what that symbol is going to be there we go so it resolved everything um, what's missing here is print should be uh, should have the value of um, what gets looked up in the, uh, the foreign declaration. And we could actually even, yeah. See, the downside to doing it this way is I really just want to, although, yeah, I don't want to indirect, really. See, this kind of sucks because then I need to add code to load print, get the address of print, load the value of print, then push the value of that on the stack. <clears throat> so this does resolve the identifier problem, but it's not. Okay, so now we were actually setting the flag, if it's foreign or not. We were setting that up front during the evaluate cycle on the directive. Then on the execute cycle of the directive, which happens after everything's been compiled and resolved. Um, well, everything's been compiled, stuff may not be resolved. 
this is where we actually load the library, find a symbol, because we maybe wanted to use this during compile time, so we have to do that. Um, and so then here, I'm just grabbing the procedure type and um, taking the signature of what we found. Um, and setting it on the uh, forward address on the procedure. So now, if that works, in the disassembled code, the print label that we create, the print variable, should it, that, that data quad word should have an address in it. It should have a value in it. And then if we dereference that value and put it into the FFI call, it will it would call that function. Yeah, there you go. So this is the address of that format print function in the actual alpha core uh, shared library. So then the question is, okay, um, that sort of fixes it. The thing I don't like about that like I said, is that's almost like the way that die libs work on OS X. Like, you have these extra levels of indirection, which I don't really like, and we don't really need that. Um, so the question is, how can I do that? So obviously we could add a flag to the label ref saying, hey, this is a foreign label or foreign procedure and we could look it up differently, right? Um, in that case, maybe. I mean, the other thing we could do, yes, is thinking, thinking, thinking. So this is a data declaration approach. What if extend the compiler, extend the assembler to support constants? So we could do an equate here and the label part, right, would still be a label. It's just that it would be a constant value. And the constant value would be this. I like that. That will work. And that avoids... Yeah. So what we're doing here is we're making an unresolved label ref with the proc name. So I'm thinking, 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 thinking. Who calls this procedure call? So we actually know, yeah, so I think like the absolute easiest thing here <laughs> um, would just be to change call foreign where we pass in the name and we just pass in the address because we'll know the address at this point. Right. And then on when we, we don't, well, I'm sorry. When we make the unresolved ref,
Because obviously we could just skip that Oops. completely there. Oh, and I need to take the unresolved off of it. Because see, that's the second thing we got to do is once we've resolved all the labels, then we need to go back through and tidy up the op brands because they're marked as unresolved. So if I wanted to do it that way, I'd just take the unresolved off. There. So, I think that's actually okay for now. Again, with the goal being to get to some of this running so that we can, I can start building out code test cases in base code or driving toward that. Yeah. That solves that problem. And that's exactly what FFI expects. It expects the address. Um, and then what we can do it is a procedure call if it's a foreign. So when we're looking at the disassembly, we'll still see the name, um, so it won't be as confusing. Yeah, there we go. So, and I think for now, just change call form to just take an address directly.
Okay. So the very last thing that has to do, be done before this could run is, well, two things. One is all the, um, all the instructions seem to be adjusted, right? So what's gonna happen, right, is now we've resolved all the labels, they all have addresses, then the instruction encoding is, it's not runnable the way it is because we have these, the, the, the values, the opcode values here are actually IDs to these labels. So what has to happen is a final step then is we go through all the instructions and if it's an unresolved label, we grab, so we know what the address here is, we grab that value and put that in as the opcode. So what will happen is um, as a final step, right, this is the value that would actually be used, um, not, not the, the label. But this is correct now. C0 is the first line of code. There it is. Boom. So, um, yeah. So here's the one other thing, right? This is pointing at the constant encoded string. And the string itself doesn't start here. It starts at the next it starts after this um, double word. So we need to add four to this, in this case, because it's a string. And not only is it a string, it's a native string, right? Um, it's going to a foreign procedure call. Uh, so in string literal, temporarily, we could hack this, I guess. Where we add four to it so that we're pointing at the right spot. All right, well, I gotta get in the habit of wrapping these things up here after two hours. It's gonna be, <laughs> it's gonna be hard. Um, but let's review this real quick, and then that'll do today's session. Um, where to start? So on assembler, I added resolve labels and apply addresses. We call apply addresses first, and Apply addresses, um, walks the blocks. This is an iterative walker. So it, it goes down the block tree. Um, and for every new block, we get called here. We loop over the entries in the block. We set the address on the entry. So the address is whatever the assembler's location counter is, which is given to us by the terp. The terp tells us where the first safe spot is in the heap. And then offset is just a local variable that we add to as we assemble the different entry types. Or not assemble here, we're, we're computing sizes. So if it's an alignment, then we're directly changing the address. If it's a section, this I don't think is going to make any size changes, but I, I put it here just in case. Um, if it's an instruction, we ask the instruction what his encoding size is, and we add that. If it's a data definition, we get the size and bytes of the data definition. And this is what, you know, increases the address. And so we apply that to all the entries in all the blocks. Then we call resolve labels. So we've given everything an address, 
not zero, which is what it was before. And now that we have addresses everywhere, we're gonna go through all the blocks and again from top to bottom. And we're going to get that block's label references. And then we're gonna loop over those and then we're gonna tell the root block, hey, find this label if you can. So it's gonna start at the top and it's gonna search down until it finds the label. Um, if it can't find a label, which we know this works, <laughs> then we get an error that it couldn't resolve it. Um, otherwise, it just keeps doing that until we visited everything and the labels are resolved. Um, and in assembly listing, oh yeah, so in add blank lines, I pass an address in because otherwise it was showing up as zeros and that was confusing. Uh, in directive, so we already had like 98% of the plumbing here. I just hadn't added this part. Um, so after, so there's two parts to the foreign directive. There's the compile time and then there's the, there's the parse evaluation and then there's the compilation evaluation, I think is probably the best way to describe it. So the parse evaluation, what it does is it shifts some attributes around if it can, and then it marks the procedure type as foreign. Um, but later, after we've done all of our work in the compiler and we're getting ready to run any metacode that might need to be run, um, we actually execute the foreign directive what this does is it attempts to load whatever library has been defined. It attempts to then find the name of the foreign function symbol that we've been has been defined. Um, and if we find all that, right, then we, in the interpreter, we register that foreign function. Um, and we have the foreign function signature now here. So then we tell the procedure type hey, your foreign address is this address. So now this procedure type, which is a foreign function wrapper, knows it's foreign and it knows where in memory uh, inside the interpreter uh, process it would need to pass to DynCall to effectively make that, make that call. Um, on, let's see, instruction block, I got rid of the unknown because it's not really needed. Um, on block entry, I added accessor and mutator for addresses. And when we set an address on an entry, we loop through all the labels and we set that. If there are labels associated to that entry, they get that address. Um, yeah, and then an entry has an address. And then I've got on instruction block two predicates, or two, sorry, callables. One is a predicate type callable, so we pass in an instruction block and it returns true or false. Uh, true means keep going, false means stop. And then we have like a, a find visitor. So this is, we pass in an instruction block and we return back an instruction block or null, depending on what, what we're doing. I added accessors for entries. We added find label, so we can recursively go down and find the label. Although this is not recursive, it's actually an iterative uh, approach to walking the block, so we don't... I'm gonna try to slowly transition things to iterative instead of recursive, so that we don't impact stack space negatively. Um, I added an accessor for label references, uh, blocks. We have the standard walk blocks for uh, the predicate version for the finder version, I made it templatized because really the, the pointer of what gets returned, and so now I think about this is not really, we're not using that, because um, I'm defining the function declaration here in line. Um, so we return whatever, a pointer to whatever T is, and we create a standard function returning T and taking an instruction block um, and then, of course, because it's templated, we have to do this here. Um, and 
call four in, you know, so now I fix the directive, we have the address. So really we have all the data to just tell, call, you know, the foreign instruction, hey, this is the exact address you should call for this thing. Um, and I think eventually for the native code compilation, we will end up with a solution that was similar to what I had, right? Because the more I think about it, we won't know. We'll have to generate code. In the interpreter, it, it's a little less problematic, but at native compile time, we will have to generate stubs that handle these. So this, yeah, will change probably, but we'll worry about that when we get there. Um, so that an instruction block, um, the, you know, we're passing the address for blank lines. We're passing the address for pretty much everything now in the, uh, disassembly output, um, calling foreign, we pass in the address. We got rid of the unresolved. We're not using an, a label ID anymore. Now this is the actual constant value that's being passed to that instruction. And yeah, accessor for entries, finding a label, excuse me, finding a label recursively, getting label references, um, the blocks, walking all the blocks. Um, then in procedure call, so if it's foreign function procedure, we just pass in the address because now we have it and we put a comment on that instruction. So it's because we took the identifier out so I put a comment on there so we can at least keep track of what's what. Because as things get more complicated, there's gonna be more of those. We need to know what we're calling. And then on procedure type, we have a foreign address, accessor or mutator. For anything internal, it's gonna be null or zero. But for foreign functions, it will be populated. In terp, um, I, I made that const. I took this op size and bytes and I made it a static inline because there's a couple other places in the code now that need to access that kind of globally. It wasn't something that the interpreter really needed to own per se. Um, in program, in compile, I got rid of this comment and we call apply addresses and we call resolve labels. And then the very final thing will be to um, like resolve instructions, right? And that'll loop through and tidy up all the addresses on instructions so that it, the code would actually be ready to go into TERP memory. And then the very final step will be encoding it in the TERP and then running it. So we're very close. All right. A bit. Unrelated question, how good, bad, difficult, silly would it be to make the native string be UTF-32 for that assembler and machine? Um, so UTF-32 is pretty heavyweight. I mean, that's, uh, I, I think, like .NET, I want to say is, is it UTF-16 or UTF-32? It's one of those. Um, it's... It's ultra heavyweight. Um, I definitely want to support UTF-8, both at the compiler level and the language level. Um, I didn't start off that way, but I'm going to slowly shift things towards UTF-8. Um, and honestly, UTF-8 is Obviously, if if you're using base code and you're in Japan, UTF-8 is probably not the most ideal encoding for you. Um, but you know, setting aside some of the like Chinese, Japanese, maybe I don't know Greek, uh, Russian, 
where they're they're in different parts of the Unicode space. Um, I mean, UTF-8 can certainly handle that. And, and then, you know, I mean, I don't know, maybe I'm just too ASCII centric uh, in my thinking, but um, yeah, I think for the kinds of software that I would want to support going down to the lowest level, having the ability to have strings be at least UTF-8 safe, but not, and UTF-8 safe strings are, um, lighter weight, right? In, in all the cases where they can be, right, they're lighter weight. So my thought on UTF-32 and all, all that other stuff would be, that, that would be stuff we would build on top of the base simplistic um, UTF-8 model. So at least that's my current thinking. Because um, my biggest concern with 32, obviously, is that you're burning a lot of memory for your strings at that point. Um, and if I were doing this only for desktop, then maybe I would think that's fine. But I do really want to target some small embeddable systems with this. So um, burning four bytes per character seems kind of horrific. Um, I think GCC at least can optimize tail calls so it turns recursive and iterative on its own. Yeah, it, yeah. That would be one of those things where I would have to like really sit down and run a recursive thing through um, GCC and Clang to see what they actually do, right? Like how effective their tail calls are, how often it does that optimization. Um, in general, I mean, this is the thing about compiler optimization. It's sort of woo-woo, right? Like you don't know, I'm gonna give an example, okay? Like the whole inline debate in C and C++. In base code, we're gonna have function inlining, procedure inlining, and if you say inline as a programmer, the compiler will obey, right? It will do what you tell it to do. It will not, it's the same thing, like we're gonna have, we already have uh, that no fold attribute, right? So the compiler will try to fold constant expressions, but if you tell it not to, it'll obey. See, all these other compilers, they're like, the magic that they do is when it happens and why it happens is magic too. And I just find that really confounding, right? And then the only way to really know is write a sample program, run it through, look at the assembly. Did it in fact truly tail call optimize or did it not? Um, and, and then what happens if you make a subtle change over time and then that breaks the compiler optimization. You know, you, you pass one more thing on the stack or you return one more thing on the stack or something happens and it blows out of their, their optimization algorithm. So um, the bottom line is, right, you just, you can't trust that stuff is, is really what I come down to. Um, you, if you really want to know what's going on with your code, you just need to structure it in a way that you know, roughly speaking, this is what the compiler is going to do with it. And, you know, again, plus or minus some, you know, edge optimizations, small edge optimizations, you're not going to be surprised um, significantly by, if you were to, you know, run it through, look at the assembly today and then run it through and look at uh, the assembly in a month or a year, it should probably look roughly the same. So, um, all right. So I'm gonna obviously continue um, working a little bit later today. 
And then I'll be online again tomorrow at 5 a.m. And yeah, so everybody have a good one. Um, let me, uh, let's see if we can find somebody to raid here. Anybody have any suggestions for a raid? Wow, there's 38 live programming streams. Hmm. Let's raid super circuits. Oh, helps if I type his name right. Thank you.